Hi, welcome everyone to another conversation on women's wisdom. I'm Prajna and my guest today is Helena Montelias. And she is originally from Sweden. However, I met her about 12, 13 years ago in Nevada City where she is currently living. And she has a really great story. You're gonna get a lot from this conversation and how she had her first baby at home, the confidence that she gained from that, her journey through spirituality and awakening, becoming more embodied in her own body, which is very important, as well as um, grief over the loss of a child, uh, sex and sexuality, the autonomy of your body, the current work that she's doing with women, and how she came also to become a facilitator of the work of Byron Katie, and so many other things. So I want you to tune in and check out her website at the Look Within Institute. She has many things to offer there. You'll learn all about her courses. And also subscribe to this channel. We really want to grow these conversations and have them meet um, more people, not only women. But as you know, when the voices of women are heard and when women become the storytellers, the human story changes. That comes from Elizabeth Lesser and her wonderful book uh, entitled Cassandra Speaks. So enjoy the conversation and tune in again at prajnaohara.com. Subscribe, share, and like. And thank you so much. Enjoy. Welcome to the Womb Wisdom Podcast, a space to slow down, connect, and reflect. And here's my guest today, Helena. Hi, Helena. Welcome to our conversation. Thank you, Prashna. I'm so glad to be here. Wonderful. So I'm just going to say a little bit about how we met. I've known you for quite some time from Nevada City. And I met you when you were developing the Woman's Temple. And of course, we were practicing hot yoga side by side every now and then. So I know you through Nevada City. And boy, that was quite some time ago. And you've been doing women's work all of this time. So in this conversation, I'm hoping that we can cover a little bit about your experience growing up in a woman's body, uh, where you were born and what that may have been like for you. And we can start there and just see how that has evolved in the process of, you know, really feeling so called to work with women and support women in all the different ways that you do. So how about giving us a, a little bit of a history? Sure. Well, lately I just turned 60 and it seems like a time to really look back. So lately I've been really looking back in my childhood and apart from some stress in my parents' marriage, it was, it was like a heaven. Um, I mean, you know, we didn't have cell phones, we didn't have internet, there were no computers. We were like little animals. We were just outside all day long, you know, um, in all the four seasons. In the winter, we were like skiing, skating, building snow forts. In the summer, we were biking to the beach, spend the whole days at the beach and then bike back. And so we were always outside. Um, I feel so blessed now that I think about it. I think it's really um, hard for young people today to be able to drop into meditation because their brains are so conditioned to constantly be bombarded, you know, with images and, and information. So, yeah, you know, there was really no difference between boys and girls in Sweden at that time. Um, when I started becoming a woman, even though equal rights had come really far in Sweden, there was definitely sexual harassment and I had some experiences around that. Um, yeah. Mm. 
Yeah, and you became a mom at a very early age. Is that right? Do I remember that correctly? Yeah. I was 18 when I got pregnant, and many people think, oh, it was a teenage mistake, but it was actually very planned. I started having dreams of this being, and his name was Yoon, that was supposed to come to me. And I had that same dream several times, and it was like this inner guidance. You are to give birth to this being. I didn't know why, or it wasn't, definitely wasn't anything I had been thinking about myself. So I got off the pill and my boyfriend and I get pregnant right away. And during the pregnancy, I started having this thought that I, I'm going to give birth to my son at home, which in those days in Sweden were unheard of. I mean, there was 99.9% .9 hospital births. Um, Sweden is a very high tech scientific country. But I just had this inner knowing that I'm supposed to give birth to this baby at home and my body knows how to do this. Mm. Uh-huh. And how did, how did that turn out? So I remember a little bit about this story and also we'll get to this later too, but you had a very strong connection. Like you said, you had a dream that this child was coming to you and mm. there's, there's more to that story, but let's hear a little bit about how the birth unfolded. Yes. Well, my baby boy was born healthy um, after about 24 hours of labor. So, I mean, it went good. It was very hard for me. I had no idea it could be that painful. Mm. So it was quite a challenge. Um, and I think I would have probably gone to the hospital if I hadn't had such a strong sense within me that I was supposed to do this and I could do it. So it really woke up a deep inner sense of confidence as a woman um, giving birth at home. Uh, my boyfriend called the hospital towards the end to ask something. So they did send out an ambulance with a midwife and with orders, there's a crazy woman out there giving birth, go get her, bring her right back to the hospital. But she was a very kind woman. She said, wow, it looks like you wanting to do a home birth. And we're like, yeah. So she stayed. And the ambulance drivers were sitting in the kitchen drinking coffee. So she helped me the last 20 minutes. Um, and then after that birth, that caused a big stir in our little local town in Sweden. I was on the front page and woman, blah, 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 gives birth at home. And uh, the following day, the head doctor of the hospital came out and said, this is dangerous. And this woman endangered her life and nobody should give birth at home. And the radio came out to interview me. So it caused quite a stir. <laughs> yeah. I like what you said there, though. It gave you confidence, though, in your body and as a woman. Yeah, it gives yes. you so empowering. Yeah. It really is. I felt afterwards like I grew, like, wow, if I can do this, I can do anything. Mm -hmm. You know, don't mess with me. I'm powerful. <laughs> oh. Don't be in, you know. Um, and it was sweet, too. A lot of older people in this rural community, they would come up and say, oh yeah, you know, I gave birth to nine kids on the kitchen table. Uh -huh. So a lot of people were very supportive. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And, you know, I just want to say, I don't recommend that you just give birth at home without a midwife. I just couldn't find anyone that was willing to do it. They were all scared to lose their jobs. Uh -huh. um, yeah. So yeah, we want to home birth. We had a dual midwife for sure. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Yeah. So that was that was um, at least forty years ago, or forty years or more then, because you said you just turned sixty. So that yes. was been about nineteen eighty. Yeah, my son was born nineteen eighty. Yeah. Uh huh. Uh huh. 
Yeah. So have things changed in Sweden? Then is it more acceptable to have home births? Yes, mm. most definitely. It was a movement that just started started then. So now, yes, you can get a midwife, you can have a home birth, and they also have created birthing clinics that are much more woman friendly <laughs> instead of the birthing rooms that were, you know, built for the doctor's convenience. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so then you didn't stay in Sweden very much longer after that. You continued on. So you were living on a farm at that time. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so where did you go from there? Like what, how did you eventually end up in Nevada city doing the work that you're doing now? Yeah, really? <laughs> <laughs> well, this home birth really awakened a spiritual longing in me. Mm. And my best friend who had also been my doula during the birth, she went to India and she met Osho Rashnish Bhagwan. He was called Bhagwan back then. And then he changed his name to Osho. This Indian guru and she came home as his disciple. And wearing all red clothes and the, had a mala with his picture on. Mm. And I thought, that looks a bit crazy, but I started reading Usho's books and I started practicing his meditations and it really opened up a whole new dimension within me. So when my son was a little bit older, we traveled here to America because Ushu had moved to Oregon and his group of people had bought this big ranch and incorporated a city, Rashnishpuram. And so I went there with my son and my boyfriend who, and at that point I had been a sannyasin for five years. Uh-huh, yeah. And what was your experience like there? Is there anything you want to share about that, that, you know, f felt important? It sounds like at the time you were feeling somewhat strong in yourself. So how was that then to become part of a community? Did things shift? Um, in many ways, it was beautiful. We lived our lives like in a meditation, in a state of meditation and celebration, you know, like every night there was music, kirtan, every morning, um, Ushu would come out and speak. And if you ever heard him talk, you know, he is a very charismatic speaker. So in some ways it was like heaven. And in other ways, um, there was a lot of misuse of power going on behind the scenes. And the deeper you got involved, the more you learned about it. So that part was really hard. Um, for example, when we got there, <clears throat> they immediately split us up. So my boyfriend was on one end of the ranch living in one place and I was placed in another side of the ranch um, where the kids and the parents lived. Um, so, I feel like the culture, and it was a culture that was very promiscuous. Like he encouraged a lot of sex. His background is that he, you know, he's from India where your, the sexual energy has been very repressed. So his idea was, you know, lots of free sex whenever you want to, because you got to open up this energy, you know, <laughs> and free yourself. Um, <clears throat> And so I went along with that. I Nobody forced me into anything. Um, but now, you know, years later during the Me Too movement, I've just been realizing, wow, that was a lot of really weird stuff that went on. And I don't feel like it freed me as a woman. Mm, yeah. I feel like it had the opposite effect, actually. Mm. I felt like it hardened my womb. Um, and I felt like it took me further away 
from what was important and true for myself as a woman. Mm. Yeah. Um, so I'm just gonna, uh, sure. Um, so so just, when you so yeah so when you say um the abuse of of power so it sounds like you know i know i've i've heard many stories from different women that were involved in this particular kind of culture so it was a culture of freedom and everybody was doing it right so it was kind of part of the scene but you said mm -hmm. there was uh, was um, Osho himself abusive to was he was he also engaged in the different sexual activities as far as you know I, I, I don't have any direct personal knowledge of it I have heard stories of um, women doing sexual favors for him mm -hmm. um, uh, it was more the leading, the group of leaders that was in that community, uh, particularly the men who were supposedly closer to the guru. I mean, they would just like point at a woman at a certain, you know, in a group or meditation circle. And, you know, okay, so I'm doing it with him tonight, kind of experience. Mm. And, and even though you had a partner. Yes. Mm -hmm. And how was that for your I, relationship with your partner then? Or was that kind of part of the play as well? Well, our relationship deteriorated and eventually ended. And I feel a big part of that was this culture of promiscuousness and, um, uh, yeah, and also pulling families apart, pulling couples apart. Mm. Yeah. 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 Um, but eventually <clears throat> the branch fell apart. Uh, Usha went back to India and I went to Seattle for a while. And then uh, I ended up in Sierra Ville Hot Springs here in California. I was learning how to become a certified breath therapist. And this man called Leonard Orr um, had his trainings at Sierra Ville Hot Springs. So I went there and from there, I ended up here in Nevada City. Um, hmm. I actually moved here, so. So how long ago was that? Oh boy. <laughs> well, I've been here for there be 20 years. 20 years? In Nevada City, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. huh. Yeah. So you were there a little bit before I was, I think. Yeah. 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 So um, then you, how, how did it come about that you started the Women's Temple? So were you doing women's work before then, like maybe your own work, or how did that all come about? <clears throat> um, well, after leaving the Osho movement, because I felt like I was out of integrity with myself, um, I was part of different women's circles, um, exploring different things. Um, <clears throat> but I was longing for something that would go deeper and that would specifically support the feminine within me. Mm -hmm. So I partnered up with Shamali, um, Shamali Ardag, who's also lived here in Nevada City for, um, she came a few years after me. Mm -hmm. She's from Norway. So we started the Women's Temple Group in 2005. And this was a group where we wanted to connect between women um, as the goddess to connect from our deeper self, not so much to connect from the personality. A lot of my experience in previous women's group was that we would meet up and then share a lot, have a lot of sharing about our problems and about our lovers. And <laughs> in the women's temple, we come together to move, to dance, to pray, 
and to embrace our emotions rather than trying to transcend them or meditate them away. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times we would just meet and move and vocally express without words what was moving through our bodies. Um, we, we honor each other as the goddess, as an incarnation of the goddess. So we'll anoint each other, um, we'll touch each other in a nourishing way. So we might have one woman laying in the middle and three, four women giving her a massage at the same time. Nothing sexual, mm -hmm. but just nourishing touch. Mm, beautiful. Yeah. Yes. So when you, <laughs> when you said that, um, because I've had very similar experiences. And when you spoke about being in the um, community in Oregon, that it felt like rather than liberating your sexual energy, that your womb had hardened. So, you know, I know for myself too, I had a similar, which, you know, a whole different organization, which I don't need to go into, but I really understand what you mean. And I have found in myself too, that when women come together and there's a whole different kind of nourishment and touching that can happen that allows you to really drop, <clears throat> excuse me, into the softness in the sensuality of your body, which is very mm -hmm. different than sex. Yeah. yeah. Would you say that, 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 the, that being in the group with women was part of maybe even not even knowing perhaps that a real deeper healing was happening around those earlier experiences? Yeah, most definitely. I mean, I didn't know from the start that that's what would happen, but yes. And we do have a womb practice where we would just sit next to each other and or one woman is laying down and just putting uh, your hands on that woman's womb. Mm -hmm. And allowing whatever is held there to arise and be released. And yeah, there was a lot of stuff there. I realized I wasn't free at all. <laughs> um, okay. And in the, in the women's temple held by other women in kindness, it was as if we could all open up mm -hmm. to a much deeper sexuality that was feminine based that wasn't based on the masculine yeah yeah beautiful yeah i remember one of my first experiences with something like that was at harbin hot springs like 20 25 years ago i don't know but being part of a women's group where that was exactly what happened it was over um oh, oh i don't know it was like two weeks and it was all uh women that were healing from rape or sexual abuse, some kind of violation and mm. all women together and, you know, coming to that place of learning to trust our bodies again and, you know, feeling that place of what is actually true nourishment and what is the place where you can say no, <laughs> yeah. you know? Mm. Yeah. Yes. Well, I remember when your group was, um, oh, I, I just adore Shamali. You know, and her work is really just so powerful. Um, I haven't seen her in a long time, but I remember at the time in Nevada City, you guys were renting out a part of my space and I was running my mm -hmm. school for special needs children. And, mm -hmm. um, oh, just adoring uh, what was happening, what I could feel energetically with the women and feeling a little overwhelmed in my own life, not knowing how I could participate but really appreciating the development and the, and what I could feel and sense in a way I felt like I benefited just kind of on the side, but, you know, mm -hmm. I was doing my own thing in different ways. And um, yeah. So, so you, and I, I just always adored you so much, Prashna, uh, seeing you as a single mom with three kids, two of them with special needs uh, to see how you were with your um, daughters in such a centered way. Like you were totally there to support and service them, but you were also so deep in your own center. I just always so admired that. I never had the feeling around you that 
you were like, oh, I'm so stressed out and overwhelmed by this. It was like, this is such a gift to me. My daughters is such a gift and uh, they make my life more beautiful. It was so beautiful to watch. Mm. Oh, thank you. Well, I think part of that too, for me at that time was um, being able to do the hot yoga and just, you know, there's something about community, you know, joining together and practicing together and also knowing that this good work was happening all around, like Nevada City is a wonderful place to live, such a strong mm -hmm. sense of community. And I think that that's also what happens, say in the Rajneesh or in the community that I was part of. I really love the sense of community and the energy of that and how easy it can be to kind of go along with the crowd and not really um, investigate or kind of bring forth our own critical thinking, our own, you know, like looking like, you know, what's happening here. And also part of that is being young too. But, you know, I think that's why it's, I, I love that you shared that story because for um, women, young women, men in general, and especially right now with what's happening in the United States, there's um, so much going on where people are losing a sense of discrimination and how to bring forward your own critical thinking and examine like what's, what's you know, making sense in all the different ways that we create divisions or come into opposition and, you know, how can we return to a sense of listening, you know, to that feminine principle really inside that is that cares, you know, like how do we come back to caring for ourselves in a way that, you know, we don't have to go up against everything that's happening around us, but also, you know, can kind of be in that posturing of openness, but at the same time, you know, no harm, but also take no shit, <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah, for sure. And it was so tricky, too, because it was all wrapped up in this spiritual package. Mm -hmm. You yeah. know, um, if you do this, you're going to get closer to the master and then you're going to get enlightened. You know, that was the big carrot we were all <laughs> longing for, you know, this enlightenment, this uh, eternal state of bliss. Mm. And that is part of the old programming of the patriarchal, you know, spiritual domain, you know, that there's some mediary and it's usually, you know, a dude who, uh, yeah. you know, you do, you do enough favors for you may get somewhere. Well, yeah. I, that's all collapsing. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So let's hear more about the, the work with the goddess. And then I believe you were, you, um, we're involved with Byron Katie's work and you're a certified Byron Katie, what would you call it? <laughs> Facilitator. Facilitator, uh-huh. Facilitator, yes. Um, yeah. Well, another thing that we do in Temple that I so love is we tune into the seasons of the year. So we have different practices uh, in the spring, summer, fall, where we kind of tune into what's going on in nature. And we um, design practices around that to turn to tune into what's going on around us. Mm. And now during COVID, um, we've been meeting outside six feet apart and all that, but we've been meeting in different women's gardens. So we went to the river one day together and just sat together and listened to the river and asked the river questions mm. and then shared what we got from the river together. Mm. So, yeah. Oh, I'm so glad you're saying that, you know, just as the mother earth, you know, listening to the earth and another thing that is so necessary has always been necessary, but especially right now. My work too brings in, you know, the, the uh, um, indigenous way of really being in reciprocity with the earth and how all of the land can speak to us and how we can mm -hmm. ask permission and listen to the trees and, 
and how that really, um, you know, has an impact on our bodies and our well being. Yeah. Yeah. So, so you cycle with that with nature. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. What about and, uh, moon cycles? Do you also do things around the moon cycles? We do. We have practices around that too. And well, now a lot of us are in menopause <laughs> or after <laughs> menopause. Yeah. So yeah, we're definitely moving into that energy of uh, becoming crowns together, becoming elders. Mm. Yeah. I'm right there with you. Good. <laughs> 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 I love it. I think it's great. I don't want to be, you know, sometimes people give you supposedly a compliment, compliment, you know, oh, you look so young or, you know, and I'm like, why is that supposed to be a compliment? I love being 60. I do not want to go back to being 20 or whatever. So, um, well, but so as I kept journeying, um, I stumbled upon the work of Byron Katie. Uh-huh. And one of the things I love about Katie, as we call her, she is a regular American woman. She's on her third marriage. She's got three kids. She's got grandkids. You know, she's not, um, you know, some reincarnated llama who sat in the cave for 15 years or, you know, something like that. She's a so-called normal American Western woman. Um, and she had an experience of awakening and she had this process come to her that's called the work. And I had gone and listened to a presentation about it here in Nevada City. And I was like, hmm, okay, yeah. I didn't see much use for it at the time. I was just about to give birth to my second child, my daughter, Leah. Uh -huh. This time I had a home birth with a midwife. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, and so I was just wrapped up in that, you know, being with my baby, meditating with my daughter and my son was there. So it's like the happiest year of my life. Um, and then, 13 months after Leah was born, my son died. Well, his body died. Um, so then I was in extreme grief and pain. And I started using the work, this process of inquiry. So the work is a process where you identify what you're thinking and believing in any moment. So, you know, my son has died. This is a tragedy. I'm never going to be happy again. It's my fault. I should have known he was doing drugs. All those burning thoughts in my mind it was just breaking me apart, really. So the work you question a thought, let's say, it's my fault that my son died. So is it true? The second question is, can you absolutely know that this idea is true? How do you react when you believe it? Well, I feel like killing myself. <laughs> Who would you be without the thought? And that's what kept blowing my mind. Who would I be without that thought? I would notice I'm in this beautiful process of love. My son's body has left this earth um, and I am just being bathed in love. And I felt my son's presence stronger than ever, right with me. Um, so the work was an extremely powerful tool for me in this time of darkness um, and pain. So I became completely devoted to it uh, because I figured if I can take myself out of this worst experience of my life and turn it into gratitude, then 
I could use this for anything. And so I've been practicing the work now for 20 years. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So would you say that that the, the work of that, um, it didn't take away the grief, you know, you still had grief and, and I can't imagine losing a child. So I just want to say, you know, and I remember seeing you at that time as well, like, oh, just, you know, just, I just want to honor that. Like, I can't mm -hmm. imagine, I, I just can't imagine that. So that's huge. So, and I just want to check this out. Is that something that say when his birthday comes around or other memories, you know, are there still times when you're really touched by, by the loss of that or, or what happens for you? Is it more of celebrating and gratitude for the life that you shared and, and, and part yeah. of, part of you still feels like he's with you. Is that right? Also? Yeah, mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm. Yeah, I find out. I found out that my son is not dead. That's an interpretation that mind makes because the body is gone. Mind goes, "Oh, he's dead," but I realize that's not possible. <laughs> he's always with me, and uh, I mean, I use the work over maybe two, three years. So I'm not saying it was like a quick fix and then I was, you know, filled with gratitude. Mm -hmm. But it brought me into presence of the process of grief. And without the story that grief is terrible, painful, heavy, a burden, um, you know, a burden you have to carry when someone dies, without those thoughts, grief was a beautiful process of just like, it was like contractions of, of opening my heart more and more and more. So the grief became actually beautiful. And it became something that was my friend that helped me to heal. It was nothing I needed to, you know, you should get over this and move on is a <laughs> common idea. It's like, I don't want to move on from this. This is beautiful. Mm. So and really want you to meet it then just to really like uh, just let it fully express itself in all the different ways. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And how was that then uh, at the same time you had your little child? So, you know, you had your newborn fairly young, mm -hmm. right? At that age, mm -hmm. at that time? Yeah. yeah, she was 13 months. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it was such a blessing. Because um, <laughs> she was um, 13 months, you know, she hadn't developed any concepts. She didn't understand what had happened. So she was super happy. Mm. You know, who would you be without your story? A toddler. <laughs> she just woke up super happy, exploring life and so it was, I mean, it was hard sometimes because she demanded a lot of my attention and energy, but for the most part, it was so good for me to have her. She helped me so much. My daughter and I were so close and I feel like that was really part of us bonding so deep. She kept me here on earth, you know, we would walk to the park and she'd be like, oh, look at the flowers or blah, 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 look at this, and, or just run around, you know. So it was a blessing. Mm, yeah, because she was just so in the here and now with you. Totally. Uh, well, that, yeah, yeah. You know, it's like I found a place that was completely at peace mm. within myself, a place that was completely unaffected mm. by this so called death. Yeah. Yeah. It was just, and it was growing every day <laughs> this piece and people would meet me you know who didn't know what would happen and be like oh you look fabulous what have you been into lately <laughs> mm. and so I feel our um, cultural belief system around death makes it very hard for us it's a very painful belief system mm. and when I question that there is so much beauty yeah on the other side of that and 
the part of the story was also that I had known he was going to pass. Mm. I had always known deep down, Jung isn't going to be here for that long. Mm. So when I got his dad's voicemail, you know, call me as soon as you can, I already knew. And in the process, <clears throat> with this, with sitting with the grief, it came to me that, you know, this is what we agreed upon, mom. Mm. And his death or his body's death became my deepest spiritual awakening. It gave me everything I had been looking for. It's really crazy to say, but it's true. <clears throat> yeah. Mm. I, I really um, get what you're saying, and I think you're articulating it very nicely because it's it's not something, you know, that's easy to articulate the, the loss of something and then to, you know, be able to say, like, it gave me my deepest and greatest awakening, you know, to the essence the truth of who you are to the real depth of your own heart and yeah. you know that just makes me think about my my own daughters you know they were born one pound each and in many ways for Libby who is um quadriplegic and doesn't have a voice you know she doesn't speak she doesn't do anything for herself and I remember I mean, I, I may have used something similar to the work in my own healing process, but, um, you know, like this kind of cultural expectation for what a person is even supposed to be, you know, yeah. for me to come to this place of the perfection of who she is just as she is and mm -hmm. the light and what that she brings in her in her very own unique way, you know, but I did go through the grief for a very long time and still sometimes I do of a missed experience in a sense of um, the loss of not he ever hearing her voice, you know, mm. of what she would say to me, but also how that has developed a, an acute capacity to listen beyond words, you know, to really listen to a person's being you know, like I, I had to learn, you know, how to just listen to a movement or a little sound or, you know, because mm -hmm. she's communicating clearly. There's an right. intelligence there. And so mm -hmm. for me too, the loss of, you know, what was so, so called in our conceptual framework of looking at life and what life is supposed to be that I didn't have that mm -hmm. supposed to be. Yeah. yeah. Then once that could, you know, dismantle, collapse, what a you know, so much peace with all of it makes it, you know, makes makes me be available to, to her because mm -hmm. she is who she is and this is enough. Yeah. I mean, I always felt that my kids are my gurus. Yes, yes. My most important, powerful gurus <laughs> who really brought me to myself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, Helena, I think it's really good that, you know, you're speaking all of this and we bring it forward and people get to listen to this because so often um, the mother, you know, the mothering, mothers, women in general as well, you know, aren't really brought front and center as, um, the wisdom of the of just how we are as householders how we are as women like what an essential aspect that is to true spiritual awakening and embodiment and really moving away from this sense of transcendence and following you know a hierarchy or a ranking system of patriarchal you know mm -hmm. no know, knowing something through the frameworks of the mind and we need this more now than ever, you know, the voices of women, the stories of women. So um, I'm really glad that you're telling your story. Mm -hmm. and, um, maybe we can come to a place now, speaking of 
you know, the work that you're doing, I, I know you have some courses that are already happening and that you mm -hmm. have been doing courses for some time. So do you want to share about what it is you're offering now to women? Yes. Um, and maybe I, I should mention first, um, I also offer classes for people who experience loss. Mm -hmm. And that's one of my dearest, dearest classes, uh, people who are sitting in grief from a loss. So <clears throat> I call that class Healing Heartbreak. Oh, beautiful. Uh, yeah, it is. I feel so blessed. Um, you know, every time I can share some of my journey and it can be of support to another human being, it's, yeah, mm -hmm. that's mm -hmm. Um But yeah, I, uh, <clears throat> I do some classes for women. I started out because I used to work myself around all my thoughts about love, sex, romance, men, what I think I need from men, what I think I need in the relationship, blah, blah, blah. Um, there were some pretty uh, strong belief structures there. <laughs> so I, I, start, I created a, a weekend seminar. It actually started on my 50th birthday because a bunch of my girlfriends and I, we went up to Sierra Vale Hot Springs and we were all in these crazy places in our relationships, you know boyfriend had dumped them or their boyfriend had someone else or or they had met a super cool guy but now they were super scared because they weren't going to get codependent again so anyway they were all like can we do the work Helena you know so sure we did the work all weekend long and we had so much fun and they said well you should make this into a retreat so I did so for 10 years I had that I called it a radical love shift where we look at what are my beliefs around love and romantic relationships. Um, then this year we, no, 2020, we couldn't do it live. So I put that online, which was great because now women from all over the world could join. Um, and then from that, we, um, we would talk about sex, but we didn't really, have time to get into it really deeply. So the women were saying, well, can we do a sex class, Helena? <laughs> I said, sure. So we started that one today, actually, the radical sex shift class. So we are looking at what's our beliefs and thoughts around sex and feminine sexuality mm. specifically. And at first we were all kind of a little giddy, like, oh, we're going to talk about sex now. Um, but then as we deepened into it, there's also a lot of pain mm. for a lot of us. Mm. A lot of women have experienced sexual wounding, harassment, um, abuse. Um, <clears throat> so it ended up, <clears throat> these classes, four weeks. So we, I used to work in going back to painful situations and unraveling what meanings did my mind make at a certain situation in my past. I'm worthless. There's something wrong with me. It's my fault. So many women believe it's their fault, which I trace back to our cultural belief system around women and sex. So so wow, it's turning out to be a very powerful class. So oh, oh, it's so good that you're doing that. Yeah. There, I want to um just say this uh to you and also to whoever listens. Maybe you've read this book, but um there's a, a book called Hunger by Roxanne Gay. Have you heard of it by chance? Oh, it's it's such a good book. But if you were to use a book for your course. <laughs> It is so oh, yeah. good, but, you know, all through um, theology school, when I was did my master's, I did it on the abuse of authoritative power and I created ritual mm -hmm. sacred drama around um, sexual abuse rather mm -hmm. than preaching because I didn't want to preach. And so in order to pass my preaching requirement, I made sacred drama 
And mm-hmm. I did these sacred traumas and I created it around the abuse of power and sexual mm-hmm. abuse. And then I pr- would present it in these different chapels and in prisons and homeless shelters and all over Boston. And it was, became this really big thing. It overwhelmed me though, eventually. I couldn't really continue it because it brought up, I was quite young still at the time. So it brought up more of my own unhealed places in myself that weren't quite resourced enough to hold space at that time for all that was coming forth. But um, Mm -hmm. in my class alone, which was um, the majority of my classmates were people of color, there were more than, um, I'd say 80% of the people, what I did is I'd have them come forward and write their name in a book as part of the ritual to kind of begin to share the secret and start to let the shame of that be released and to be witnessed in community and to be held in prayer. And 80% of the people in my class would come forward men included, mostly women, but men included. And the only ones that didn't come forward actually were white men. So Mm. yeah, so it was quite interesting. I'm not saying anything about that as far as statistics go, because this was one group. But so it's really great that you're doing that. And I feel like in my own healing also around that, it's it's like it comes in layers, you know, and Mm -hmm. and can create that you're creating this container and this group of safety for women to be able to, you know, let those layers like, yeah, like you said, so much comes up, right? You're finding. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's a journey, you know, you know, healing from rape and sexual abuse is a long journey. Yeah. And to regain the autonomy of the body, you know, so I think it's amazing that you're doing that. And I'm going to send people your way. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. How long does the course run? Uh, this one's four weeks. Mm-hmm. And will you repeat it? Yes. Yeah. Oh, beautiful. Yeah. I mean, I had the most people I've ever had for any class for this sex class. So it seemed like a lot of women are ready to have an honest conversation about this mm-hmm. topic. Yeah. And to look at what at, what are my beliefs in this area. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, another area that <clears throat> I found was also around women's body image. Mm-hmm. So I developed another class called My Body, My Temple. Mm-hmm. Because so many women are so self-critical of their bodies and judge their body mercilessly. Mm. And so in that class, we look at my thoughts about my own body. I'm too fat, I'm too thin, I'm too old, I'm too this, I'm too that. I mean, I even have have one client, she's 12 years old and she's already believing that she's not perfect enough, you know, she doesn't live up the images that is shown on social media and it just uh, breaks my heart yeah i think it's so tough for the young people because they have so much exposure with the, like you just said the social media mm-hmm. yeah. yeah well good well like we're almost coming to the end of our time i'm just noticing that now and um mm-hmm. So what I want to ask you here to kind of like, first, is there anything else you want to say about your course? Um, no. Just... No, and then in the notes, we'll have your, um, how, how people can reach you. I'll put that in, in the notes. And, yes, um, look within Institute. Look within Institute, good, yes. good, <laughs> all there. And, um, yeah, so like just if do you have a, a nugget, a, a jewel, a gem, a word of wisdom, or you know, a message that you want to gift women with or our listeners, whoever's listening? Um I would say look within. Mm. Everything you need is there. Mm. Yeah. It sure is. 
Yeah. And for some people, would you say that, well, especially some of the topics that we've been speaking about, just to fill that out a little bit, for some people, they need to feel even a sense of, um, you know, for the nervous system to slow down, to pause enough, especially if there has been violation and trauma and with so much that is going on right now um, in our world. So how does a person come to that space where they can just, you know, pause and truly look within? Yeah. Well, you know, um, you can, people can find me on SoundCloud. If you go to soundcloud.com, um, look within Institute. I have a whole series of guided meditations that are free. Mm, good. And they're free to download as well. Um, because yes, it does help to have some guidance um, or have someone holding a space for you to drop in <clears throat> and find that stillness that's beyond your thinking. Yeah. And to feel that, you know, that capacity to turn everything off, you know, and take time for yourself to just go inside. Yeah, I have mm -hmm. a whole playlist called Your Interior Life <laughs> on my YouTube. So, mm -hmm. you know, we work very similar in that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, Helena, so wonderful mm -hmm. to speak with you. And, you know, um, just so the listeners know, I'm living in Santa Cruz right now, so we're not neighbors anymore, but I look forward to when we can get together and perhaps do something together for women. It would be so great. Yes, yeah. I would love that. Yeah. yeah, I really love what you're doing. So thank you for coming on to the conversation. And yes, thank you to all of the listeners. And be sure to subscribe to Prajno Hera YouTube. And there are more conversations that have already happened and many more coming forward. Thank you for listening. Have a beautiful day. Thank you, Prashna.